except <laughs> after Normandy, we're going to take questions. After Holland, we're going to take questions just to give them a little relief. And after the Battle of the Bulge. And I'll let Ray just take right over. I'm going to hold the mic so he can focus in on his talk. Ray Nagel. Uh, this is our uniform, that, our dress uniform that we had uh, during the war summer issue. Otherwise, we had the wool one. And uh, I'm, I'm less weight now than I was when I was in the service. So uh, it, uh, this isn't the original one, but I, I replaced it. Had one more it out. <laughs> I'll start from, uh, I got drafted in uh, 1942. I got a card from the President Roosevelt. He said, uh, you're in the Army. So I went to Fort Bragg. And, uh, not Fort Bragg, I went to Fort Snelling. And they uh, told me to come back in a week. And they issued me all the clothes and the overcoat that went to my ankles. With a big heavy over the wool overcoat and everything, and uh, they, they put me, told me to stand on these, these two footprints down here. Then they measured my feet, and I think he had two two sizes. And I wore seven and a half, and uh, so I went down to Fort Bragg and, and uh, but uh, it, well, I'll just tell you about the shoes. That, uh, I got blisters. Went on a hike for 15 miles the next day, yeah. and I got blisters on my heels. And and we go Tuesdays and, and uh, Thursdays every every week. And I got blisters every time I went out, and it couldn't heal that quick. So the first sergeant, uh, not the first sergeant, uh, the officer, he said, uh, "What's wrong with your feet?" And I said, "Nothing wrong with my feet." I said, "Just give me nine shoes, and I wear seven." <laughs> and he, he said, uh, go to the PX, or the PX, or, or I can't think of what they uh, Quartermaster. Quartermaster. Quartermaster, yeah. And get, get the right shoes. So I did, and then I didn't have any trouble after that. But anyhow, just jumped way ahead. So then I went to, we got to Fort Bragg. They said, you're in the 101st Airborne. You're not a volunteer. And, uh, but the parachute was volunteered, and they got $50 a month. Uh, over their base pay, so we got $80 a month. Well, I guess it was 21 then uh, that we was getting the first a month. And uh, then we got, uh, they, they raised it to 30. But uh, we didn't get any raise at all. And then after Normandy, they said, uh, we got back to England. They said, uh, we uh, lost 60% of our troops, so you'll get uh, flight pay. So we got that from $50, and then it was $30 base pay, so it was $80 a month. It was pretty darn good. But uh, I'll scroll down my notes here. Uh, the glider, it uh, weighed 370 pounds. That's Jim Eagle. 370 pounds? No, more than that. 370 pounds of glider weight. Uh, the empty 3,100. 3,100, yeah. And uh, it was uh, 83 foot wingspan. We're as big as a uh, football field. And uh, it carried its own weight. So that was a printer three, about a three and a half ton. It was getting towed by this C-47. And uh, the tow rope that was pulling, we would hook to the C-47, was 300-foot nylon rope. And uh, we never had any of a break that, in our outfit. So, went to Fort Bragg and was there for six months, training in the gliders and loading and unloading and, you know, basic training rifles and uh, 75 howitzers. We were artillery supporting the infantry. Uh, we there for six months and then we went to New York by convoy. And uh, 
We were there for a couple, two or three days, and we got on the ship's transports going to uh, England. And uh, we left June 5th, and uh, we went to uh, Southampton, England, and we got off there, and they took us to Oxford, England. Uh, well, a couple miles from there, we were, that was our base camp. And uh, we stayed there for a, a year, till June uh, 45, 44. And, uh, or what? I'm getting mixed up here. 43. For, we was in, in we was in Fort Bragg for six months. You know, we was in England for six months, and then uh, we went to uh, Normandy. June. But uh, well, we were supposed to go June 6, but it was uh, so uh, the, we had 14 foot waves, and uh, LSIs. I don't know if you know what they are. They hold uh, probably about 20 troops standing up. And they had to go from, from England to uh, Normandy, and they were like a little matchbox. And with uh, just, a, a, but I think it's about 25 troops in there. But we went on a big troop transport, uh, half of our division on Susan B. Anthony, and another half on the uh, Mos Mosby. And that, that, uh, that was an equipment ship. It took the jeeps and the guns and some of, half of our troops. The ship we was on had 2,600 of us. And uh, the uh, half of our division was 101st, and then half the 90th division was on the ship with us. We got to uh, England uh, on the 6th. Well, no, we, it was, the weather was so bad, we stayed overnight on the ship in, in the harbor. And the next day we went out, and it was still bad weather, but we had to go anyhow. And uh, we were supposed to get off at 7.30, T plus 1, and uh, the artillery. And uh, so we got there at 7.30 and we had all our pack. First time in, you got hand grenades hanging all over and ammunition and you got, it was supposed to be about 80 pounds, but it, it was uh, more than that. Everybody cared more than they should have. So after we got to the harbor, harbor over the, not the harbor, but the beach, and uh, the ship was supposed to empty uh, get us off on LSI's transfer to, to, to go in. And they was out about half a mile, the big ship, and it hit, hit a mine just before we got ready to get off. We was all ready to get off, but we had all our weight on 80 pounds of weight. And uh, when it hit that mine, it was just like hitting a brick wall. We all fell down and, 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 and put the power out, and uh, no lights in the ship at all. And they had lights hanging somewhere, but you didn't know where they were. The flashlights, and uh, so, but we were on E deck. That's level with the outside. So we got, got somebody got the door. It just the, the, the cloth doors on the in the ship here, and so we all ran out, and uh, and we had our packs on and everything. And we stood there for about oh half hour, and everybody come up. And some come up wet, uh, and some come up to the shoot or uh, where they lower the supplies, swam up in, the, in that, and the ship started listing right away. And then so we were all standing outside there and didn't know, nobody knew what to do. And so we, uh, all American ships were going back and forth, passing us up, and, uh, taking prisoners out, troops in. And uh, I thought, why the heck don't they stop and pick us up? And uh, it was 7.30 in the morning. And uh, not an American ship would pick us up. There's four to five thousand there, D Day plus one. So uh, we didn't, nothing we could do. And it was a huge ship, so it did, wasn't bobbing too bad. And then uh, all of a sudden, about an hour or so, here comes three British ships down from the north, from their area, and picked us up. And we were in the American area. And I, I, I said, the worst damn Navy in the world is American Navy. They won't even have the troops up. So they picked us up and we'd go down that rope, the first ship, and they said, ferry over the next ship. But uh, I was on the, hanging on the outside rail on this ship here. And so I was reached over. I just got a hold of the ship and it went out like that. 
with that 14 foot waves, they were going up and down and in and out and banging. So anyhow, they come the second time and I grabbed hold of it and I left go and I jumped up and I never saw anybody go down but I just about went down myself. So we got on the second ship and they said we gotta wait till it gets full. So we had to wait till everybody else filled that ship up and then we took off. And so uh, we pulled away from that ship and, and uh, we just waited for the other ships to get full. And they gave us tea and crumpets and it was nice and warm in here. It was cold outside with that wind in June 6th. So they got, all the ships got full and they pulled away. And then the ship, they wanted, we heard that they wanted to uh, beach it, push, push it in or pull it in or something on the shore. And our captain said no, he, he didn't want it. It was a, a ship that used to run in South America. And, but we didn't know at the time. They had phosphine gas shells, our, our shells, some of our shell, in case the Germans used them. So that's why they didn't want to beach it, because if it dropped a bomb on it, they'd, they'd catch the whole Utah beach. So now we, we didn't find that out until uh, the last uh, June. I, I wrote an article in the Legion, and one of the Navy guys that was on the shore that day said, how come you didn't mention you had phosphine gas in the ship? And uh, I said, we didn't, nobody knew it, except the, the captain, I guess. He said he wanted to sink it. So he left it right out there where it was. And then when it, when it did sink, it went down the back end, went down, and, and it, it hit bottom, and the top was still sticking out of the, out of the water. But it did finally went down and it did go into water so they, they couldn't, they wouldn't uh, probably shoot bomb it or uh, submarine it and knock those shells apart. But uh, if they would have used, if that would have, the gas would have spilled it, then they, but the Germans would have used it. But uh, we found out later, after we got in charge, they said, turn in your gas mask, uh, you don't need them. And, but we, we, they wake us up at 1, 2 in the morning and we go for a hike and gas attack and they pull the gas mask open and put, and nobody, I didn't want to turn mine in because I didn't trust them. But I kept it for a few days and then they finally they had to turn it in so I grabbed one of theirs and kept it for another week or so and then but, but we figured they weren't going to use it. But I later found out that uh, uh, Hitler uh, told them, use the gas, or uh, use the gas shells to push them off the, off the beach. And uh, they, they said, the officers said, uh, we can't do that because it will kill all our horses. And that they had half, they didn't, they didn't have many trucks, so they had the horses and, and uh, carts that they used for transportation. And so they didn't, they said they're not using gas. But I they had to, but so, you know, we got, we got 11 or 10 o'clock in the morning we were supposed to be in at 7.30. The, uh, it was on the British ship, and it was on their frequency. And we weren't on the American frequency, and they, they had somebody in short as a signal for it, each ship to come in at the right time. And they finally found out, somebody said, that the Susan B. Anthony sunk, and they we're on the British ships. So then they called the British, and uh, this is 10 o'clock in the morning now, and that saved us from going in at 7.30. And so uh, we lost 60% of our division in London going in. There was some woman in the, uh, directing uh, firepower from the, in, in, the, in shore ways. She was in an empty house in the attic. And uh, they, they were knocking the LSIs out. As soon as they come in, it, it'd be short and then, uh, maybe to the left and then to the right and, and hit, direct hit. So they knew somebody was looking from the shore and directing fire. So they, they sent up some infantry, and sure enough, they found this woman up there, and uh, they brought her out to the beach, and we was on the beach there in the morning. Our second ship put the supplies didn't get in until the next day, so we had to stay there on the shore waiting. In the meantime, some officer came down, the colonel, and uh, said, we need, what are these troops doing here? And he said, they were, we're waiting for our, our ship to come, the supply ship to come in. And he said, well, we need the infantry up, up there bad. So they, they said, uh, they said, well, where artillery? And he said, well, we need artillery worse. So they didn't want us to go up there. And we had uh, 300 troops there. 
so we didn't have to go up. So then we stayed there overnight, and our uh, you know, ship came in the next morning. Uh, and then we, we uh, first town we took it was Carrington. That was about a, a little mile and a half or two miles inshore. And uh, we, we took that town, and the Germans counterattack took it back. And so then the next morning, we called in, you know, that night, we called in the, uh, uh, that's what they call those ships, the 14, 16 inch guns. And they, they threw the, uh, just a little five or six shells in there, and the whole town was on fire. It was just a small town. And the next morning, we walked right through it and, and started fighting the Germans. So, and we were supposed to go across the peninsula, the Sherbert Peninsula there. It was a big point out there, the Navy base on the end, on the, out on the end. And uh, we wanted that Navy base to unload our big ships because we were bringing them into shore. They had run everything on LSIs and LSTs, landing craft infantry, landing craft tanks. They had to bring all that stuff in <coughs> small ships. And uh, then about the fourth day, we had a, I don't know what they call it, some kind of a windstorm, about 90 mile an hour wind. And the two ships in shore and kept them over. And we had a, a doctor that we brought over. He put the uh, cement in the bottom. When he got there, they flooded it. And, and they used that for a ramp to dock like. And, uh, but it tore that thing all apart, too. And then uh, we got across. We started going across the peninsula to cut it off. And then we were supposed to go out and empty it out. But we got halfway across, or not more than halfway. And then they said, the troops are coming in so fast that the airborne is too valuable. So we've got to go back to England to get them, uh, ready for another mission. No one knows, only a week, a couple of weeks. So uh, we went back to England. Well, after 29 days, I went uh, back to England. And, and the first mission was the Black Forest, right off the beach there, a couple of miles in. And Patton was going so fast, he, the supplies couldn't keep up. So they told him to, he got to the Black Forest, stop there, and then we'd fly in from England, cut the communications and, and hit the Germans' artillery and, and wipe them out in the back, in the, behind the lines. And he kept going again. But he was gung-ho for himself. And if he wanted us to get in the glory, we weren't happy about it either. It was a hell of a job going behind the lines. <laughs> So anyhow, he, he went past our drop zone, and then it takes another three weeks before we can get another drop zone. And uh, he went past the drop zone, then he stopped, and then the supplies caught up to him. So. Okay, let me just stop. Any, any questions on Normandy? Uh, and the uh, training stage with gliders, do they actually train up in the air with the gliders? Oh, we went up, yeah. Just to train that way? We went, uh, in the United States, we went up every, every week. Tell them what the question was. Did you train in the gliders? Well, we, 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 yeah, we trained uh, loading them up and, and tying them down, uh, guns down in one glider and the in another glider and uh, ammunition. And we, we, had, we trained every week in the glider. And we flew to, and uh, the first time we flew in the glider, I looked out the window and, and the wings were going like this here. <laughs> and I thought they were going to break off. But that's what they're supposed to do. But I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> and then another, another time we had, had lunch and uh, we had cherry nectar for dinner. And we got into gliders and just one person, he got, he, we start, the gliders started moving, the C-47 started pulling it. And he had his helmet took the liner out, it's just a steel hammer, and uh, use it for a spit to vomit it. He vomit every time it took off me one way. And, uh, but half the guys got sick, that vomit smell. Yeah. It, 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 I, I never got sick, I was seasick, but uh, some people are just prone to it. But uh, anyhow, it was, that was a horrible day. Any other questions? Was it like taking off in that glider? Did the C-47 get airborne first, and then the glider? No, we did. 
Uh, with the, the 300 foot tow rope, uh, it was tight. And then when they got ready to go, they put the brakes on and revved the engines up, two propellers, two, two motor, and uh, they'd get it going, about, uh, I think it took about 10 minutes. Top speed with the brakes on, and our glider was just shaking back there. I think if we'd have dropped our flaps, we'd get an air, right? Because it was enough glass coming back. And as soon as he got the speed up, then he took off down the runway, and then we we about, oh, I'd say 50 feet, we dropped our flaps and, and we were up in the air all the way down the, the runway. And uh, we were flying, we flew about, oh, 50 feet above the glider, if we get out the prop flaps, when we were flying all the time, we were way above the glider. And, uh, but it, uh, like uh, I'll tell you later, but we was in the fog over to England, went to Holland from England, and we never saw the glider for three and a half or two and a half hours, and we we followed the road. I'll tell that later. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, let's go on to Holland. No, I'll start with that fog, yeah. So uh, we had, uh, I'd say, eight, ten airports we were going from for our battalions. And uh, so the paratroopers go two or three hours early, and they're supposed to clean off the whole area. But it was in the States, they said, what you'll do is the paratroopers will land on an airport, and you will come in, they'll clean it out, and you'll land at the airport to get out, and then they'll take the wounded people back from the airport to the hospital or wherever. And, but that never happened. We, we always landed in the, in the, in the, in the lines in the field somewhere, in cornfield or any field that was open. But uh, the, uh, then they said, uh, you, you, uh, we had uh, emergency shoots in case some trouble in the air in the States. We got deep and they said, we're short of tr uh, suits, you can't uh, job shoots, we'll take them away from you, and you don't need to shoot to land in the glider anyhow. So <laughs> they took the shoots away, then they said, we had a co-pilot and pilot, and they said, you don't need two pilots to land a, a glider, so we're going to take the co-pilot away, and one of your troopers can sit in the front, and you'd have one extra trooper then. So then the, they said, you got to take over the controls after you got in, they got in the air, then we take over the troll, control and just see what, how to the in and out, up and down. And uh, rudder, or the, the, for the, I can't think of the pedals, the two pedals there for, for the, those. Uh, rudders. Rudders, yeah. So anyhow, we all, anybody that wanted could go up there, and, and, and it's all plexiglass, and, and here is this rope is right there, and that's that's all you can see is a rope. You follow the plane, but that was nothing to it to steer that. And it would be for landing because you got to land in, at uh, about 125 miles an hour. Otherwise, that four ton is going to just flop out and you know, hit the dirt, and, and just if you aren't coming in fast enough, you're not it's not going to glide. Uh, in the fog, yeah. So, did you release or did the C-47 release? Either one. But if, if they released, it was a big coupling. And uh, if that came back and hit that plexiglass, or the rope even snapped when it went by you, it would probably break off that plexiglass and they'd just go flying right down. There. So they didn't want to release on this. If they put, dropped the, we, we had a wire around the, the rope, radio, but you got in the air and you couldn't hear a thing. It was so noisy, you had to shout to the person next to you. It was noisy. And uh, so you couldn't communicate it after you are in the air, which was a dumb thing. And, uh, but uh, the, uh, yeah, it was fog, and fog, it's, it's supposed to be about 7.30 in the morning, because the paratroopers is gone about 4. And without our children's support, they're going to get wiped out. So we were supposed to get there at 7, uh, 
when they leave at 730, get there like three and a half hours later, it took that long to go over there. So we uh, uh, took off from the runway. They tightened up the rope. They, we, got, we were supposed to leave at 730, so we're leaving at 10 now. And uh, so they tightened the rope up. It was tight when we got out there. And we had loaded the day before the glider. So they tightened the rope up and revved up the engines, took off and we followed the rope down the runway. We didn't even know what was pulling us, you couldn't see it. We never saw it, the C-47, but we knew it was C-47s. So we took off and followed the rope, and we never saw the plane for two hours until we got it's over the channel. We saw water one time as low as the bot. It was forgotten the fog then. So we're flying along for two hours, and all of a sudden, we, the plane that was pulling and towing us, he was running into a glider in front of him. We hadn't seen anything. It was supposed to be sex to us in the flight. <clears throat> and uh, then they had the Lancasters, and the fighter planes couldn't go over there and back. So they had to have <coughs> British Lancasters, the bombers. They went bad, circled us, kept us circling us, as supposed to be. We never saw any of them either. Didn't see anything for two and a half hours. It was over the channel, all of a sudden our plane was <coughs> He was running into a glider. We didn't know it, and, and we're flying higher here. All of a sudden, we, we went past the plane was blowing us. We woke us way back, and by that time, we were stalling out with a four ton, and I ran on top of the plane, and they, they looked up at us, and we looked down at them, and they grabbed up, and, and got out of our way, and that big tail fin in the back, it was, it was, uh, I thought we were going to hit it, but we, we missed it. And if we had touched that plane with our, our glider, we would have flipped the plane right up in here and, and with our tow ropes all together, and we'd have probably both went down in the channel. But we, he got out of our way, and, and that rope tightened up and it gave us a heck of a chair. Because we were just stalling out then, and he was going. So we, about another half hour, we were going along in the tow plane on our left went under our rope, and the glider went on top, and we, we were coming together, two gliders with the ropes crossed. So, anyhow, they, our, our plane, they, no way to tell them that they, what they were doing, but they saw each other, and they went back the right way, instead of twisting the ropes. Um, so they went, they parted. Then by that time, our pilot was getting kind of worried. So instead of going directly east to Holland, we went a little bit southeast, and we came out, and we were the only plane in the sky, and we and we just come to land right away. It, and it was just like a just a bright sunny day, and we were all alone. But they must have had binoculars and saw that what happened with our our pilot. So he went a little bit more directly east and caught up to him, but he sped speeded up, and we we're. 130 miles an hour is supposed to be our maximum, but I know he went faster than that because our glider was just shaking. So now we caught up to the, the gang, and just about that time, we were flying about 1,000 feet, the, uh, the ac ACAC started coming up. And so then our tow planes, they went way down because the higher you are going 130 miles an hour, they can shoot at you for a long time. So they went down, and the one on our left, the C-47, his, his, uh, his propeller, he was so low, he, he cut the leaves off the tree. And the leaves went flying back, and we were right behind him. And, uh, and then, then one of the other planes uh, up ahead, it all of a sudden just turned and went into the ground. It must have been direct hit at the pilots. And it, it just blew up, the glider got loose. All they had to do in the glider was just hit the button like that and re release the clamp or the C-47 to do the same thing. So we kept on going and we was looking down and here the guys were shooting at us and if, had we, if we had the door open, it was just a little door, we could throw the hand grenades out on top of them. It takes five seconds to the hand grenade when you release it to explode. We could have got all kinds of those guys down there. But nobody thought of it. And they would have probably got some of the C 47s because they were so low that the strapper couldn't go up to. But I thought that we should have thrown some out, but we didn't. Uh, I just want to talk about uh, Walter Cronkite. 
um, he wanted to get in because he was a reporter and he had to get in immediately. And they said, well, did you go by paratroop? Have you had training? And he said, no, I don't have any training, but I can do it. And he, they said, no, you're going to go by glider. He said, well, fine, I want to get in anyway. Well, Walter said in his own words, he said, I shipped for three and a half hours. <laughs> never realized how dangerous that seemed to go in a glider. And he made it. But he said, if you have to go into combat, right, Jim? Do not go by glider. Walk, skip, jump, swim, <laughs> do anything. But I repeat, do not go by glider. We have monuments out to Fort Snelling. I don't know if you've been out there at 101st Airport. You come in at the, the last road going in, in the there's, we've got a whole block of uh, every battalion that was in the 101st, and he's on the 321st, and he's got that same same thing <laughs> in there. Uh, it came into a plowed field. Yeah, we landed in a plowed field, potato field, and uh, we had uh, communications back in England with the underground, and they said, don't come, because uh, uh, Arnheim, that was a German town, and that, that's what their their uh, airborne division was going to land, the 6th Airborne Division. They only had one division, they borrowed two of ours, the British, and that was their area, so we were the only Americans there. And uh, the, uh, I, our, the I, Mount Cummings was begging Ike before we went to uh, go there. It's a, it's a 50 mile deal. You know, it would be good tank country to get across the Rhine there. And I said, no, it'll never work. And he kept begging them, and after, I think, a couple of months, Eisenhower gave in and said, okay. But when they told us that there was an armored division just pulled in Arnheim to rest, he said, the hell with it, we're going to go anyhow. But it was his division, or his airborne division that was up there. He wanted us to go put the armored division up there. I said, no. And they got they wiped out seven thousand of the nine thousand troops, their own troops. And uh, so there was just a catastrophe up there. We landed the first one behind the lines, and they were supposed to break through to us. So we we all were supposed to do was hold a road up in about twenty miles, each division twenty miles. It was about fifty miles. And uh, the, but anyhow. We were the first division there, 101st and then 82nd and the 6th. So we uh, kept the road open. Well, first we got to go back. I was supposed to, we were supposed to take a bridge and keep that uh, keep the open until the British come through. But uh, they didn't come through with it, so we had to go down and keep the road open. And no Germans were around at all. And they didn't know anything about it until, until the second, well, the first day they found out what was happening. And they pulled in there fast on, the, on, the, on that whole road watching, trying to break it through to it. And uh, they, uh, they were, their whole division is back here with the whole army. And they, they, they couldn't break through to us the first day, or the second day. So they called us, and we had our artillery and jeeps. We brought them in with the, glider, with the gliders. So we turned around and went back to the front lines and start shooting them from behind. And the British were shooting at the other side. We got them through the second day in the afternoon. And by that time, the, 88, the Germans had their 88s all along that road. And it was below sea level. And so it was just like an airport flatland for 10 miles, you could see. And the 88s would shoot about seven, eight miles. So they had them shooting artillery on the road as soon as the tanks came through. And they knock out a few tanks, and it was just a dirt road. It was about four foot high above the ground. And the tanks came through, and they, they got the first one and the second one, and the third one, and then we got that bulldozer up, the British bulldozers up there. You push them off, off the road. Then they got the bulldozer. Then we got another bulldozer, but was, everything was screwed up. And finally, they, they uh, called in the fighter planes, they were circling around and they found out where their 88s were, knocked them out, and uh, then they got the tanks going and, and we had to sneak along the road. The, the shells were still coming in, but the road was this way and the shells were coming in from that way. We were going along, sneaking along the, down below the road here, four foot high, and then there was ten, tanks were 10 foot 
eight, ten foot high. So they were four feet foot out in the air of, of this flat land. And they, they just had a wild time shooting those tanks out. So it just the whole thing collapsed. And uh, we kept the road open. And we, had, we stayed there and fought with them. It was supposed to be a five day mission for us. It was, ended up 69 days. And I think the British, I, I, I just don't, they aren't as fighters like we were. And I think they wanted to keep us there. I know they did because they kept us there 69 days. And, um, but they make tea, they stop the war. Tea's got to come first. Right on the highway, right on the highway, the shells were coming. They said, they were crying there. But we lost one of our officers, he got killed with shrapnel. And we said, get down in the ditch on this side so the shell would go over you. And, uh, but I don't know, they're, they're real nice people, but I don't know if they were not good fighters. I don't think they were. But then they always stayed there 69 days. Was that? No, it's about, it was about 60th day we were there, just holding up there. We couldn't get across the line, but they pushed it back. So it, nothing was going on, just holding for, for, for 69 days. But the 60th, but the 60th day, the Germans found out that, well, they didn't find out, they, they just, they didn't have an artillery. And the, the one division, they, they just started coming through our front lines, we were on the front lines. And so we opened up with our 75s, we had six of them, they had two batteries of six, and we opened up with both of them. Then we called in our 155s, they got 12 guns too, here behind us, and then our 155s and 240s. They still kept coming, and so they called in all the British uh, guns in the tanks, and the, they, we gave them the, the coordinates of where, where to shoot. And we had 105 artillery pieces shooting in this one area. And nobody got through. And then after an hour and 15 minutes, they would come out and wave white flags. And I don't know if I should, but, uh, our colonel, infantry colonel, he didn't like what they were doing. So he said, throw in a few more rounds. So we did, and that was at 4.30 in the afternoon. And uh, so the, they couldn't drag anybody out. In the morning and groaning, we were about a half a mile from them. And so anyhow, they, we, they waited till it got dark and then they came out and, and they did drag some of them back that were alive. But the next year we went down there and they had a book, one of our books, and we wrote that they killed 80% of the division. And I don't know what the German division is, around 20,000, but I don't think it was a full division. And uh, not a soul got through. So, uh, and about, you can imagine the 80 percent of a division, how many people that is, and was. It was all hamburger when it was done. And now we're 15 minutes of shells exploding, and big shells come from the night. But uh, so we were there about oh, another, well, about six, seven, eight days in the rain and the sunshine. And the stench was so bad we couldn't even eat. It was just it was all sick pretty much. But uh, it, maybe it was all done then. Nothing came in after that. So uh, then we got March order. And uh, after about seven days, and uh, the Scotch people took over and brought their guns in and put them in our position there. And uh, the uh, Germans, they could stand their own stench over there. And so they took and uh, uh, blew a dam, a dike or whatever it was, and flooded the whole area. And the, and the Scotch had to get out of there because it was low land there and get their guns out. And they took off. And we had marched for it already a couple of days before that. And we, that was our end of fighting up there. So we went, went down to uh, France then. Any questions on how? About the landing, when you landed your glider. Perfect. We <laughs> <laughs> got 60 in the flight, and we never saw them until we got to Holland and did the land. And then, I, I don't know, there must have been a lot of crash in the air uh, with 60 flying, and you couldn't see each other. But uh, we had Lancasters flying around, and I never saw any of them. And uh, we never saw, never saw another glider 
except that one that went underneath our rope until we got on land. And that must have been at least three hours. And we were just fine following the rope. What did you land in? Potato field. It had just plowed it out. We had underground to kind of dock the, the radios before we went. We had dug the potatoes a couple of days before. So it was a soft landing. And the gliders, the, 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 the wheels, this big around, and uh, they, they're the cast aluminum the, the, uh, brackets, and they would snap off. And then there's two skis on each side, and uh, so if the wheels break off, it's real easy to just crack and snap off the aluminum, the cast aluminum. And then uh, but we landed right up to a hedgerow, not hedgerow, but a, a ditch, irrigation ditch. And you, you dig down in, you tip the back the glider up, and then you, you dig them with the skis, and the glider is just like a toboggan in the front straight across. And it, it packs the dirt in the dirt in the front, and some of the time the dirt packed in the front so much it came right in and got the, the legs of the pilots, broke the, broke, broke the front end. Some collided too. Well, a lot of them collided. And you've got to watch when you get out of the glider because everybody's coming in the same direction. But then somebody sees a place over here and they turn and going to land over here. Well, that's bad. And so we were on, I don't know how it got in front because we were in the back when we, we were coming across the channel. And we went off and on our own. We caught up and we were in the back. But there was some still landing after a while. So I had to look up. And you're going to do your road over there. So you got to look up and you know, see if anybody's coming. We can't hunt, there are no horn to hunt. And, and uh, they're, not going, they're not going to turn and miss you because it's, it's four ton. They're just going to knock you down. And, so you got to watch out yourself. And here I looked up and here's two of them coming. And they were, they were both had turned. And they were going like this here. And then they went like that and landed right in front of me. And just, a lot of them got killed right away. A lot of them, they come in and they, they stop some land in a tree and stalled out and just fell down in the tree and, and but the leaves and branches held them up. Any other questions? Any other questions? How long can you glide after you cut off? Not long. Four times. You come down fast. You gotta come down fast. He's not going to glide because you're going to fall. You don't have much choice of where you're going to land. Then. No, you got to, right away, you got to find out where you're going to go. And you don't want to turn and get somebody else's way. But uh, there were 60 gliders landing that one. There were two fields there, potato fields. Uh, we, we left there. They were having trouble at Frankfurt, uh, Germany, so we we were just assaulters. So we went up to Frankfurt, Germany, and, and relieved some of those troopers. We were helping too for a week or so, and then uh, we were supposed to go down down the coast, uh, down the south in France, but the Marmel in uh, Marmelon. There's a French uh, camp there, and we've been on the line for 69 days. And uh, so we were going to this camp. The first guy, uh, we, they pulled in uh, in Holland there just before we left. They pulled in a portable shower. And so it's, uh, one afternoon they said, uh, we could take there were six trucks. We took six trucks of the guys and went to, we got in the shower. And we had, that's the first shower we had, the only shower we had in 69 days. <laughs> And, you know, we got a shower, and you got in there, and it was nice and warm, and oh, it felt so good. They said, two minutes, and we're shutting the water off. It just got soaked up. And then, so we had to get that soap off, so we, well, quick, just wash the soap back off, and we got dry, and then they had to offer a feed or a movie that night. And so we stayed there until uh, we got there about well, 8 o'clock, and, and, the, the, and the movie was over. During the midnight, we're taking the six GMC trucks back in the dark, and you can't have lights on. 
and so Bill the green light, you can't really see him standing in front of him. As we got back, I about halfway back, and they said, halt, and they called us, and they said, where are you going? And they said, we're going back to our front lines. And they said, but well, you're in the front lines right now, no man's land. And so we had to back those trucks up in those little roads, like, like an alley. We back up six trucks, and finally got them all turned around, it was around midnight. And no noise at all, it's quiet as to be in the dark. And they, they usually can shoot a flare up. They, we got flares that the Germans have too, and they're on parachutes. And they, they're white phosphorus, they come down and they light up everything. But they didn't shoot any up, and we got the trucks turned around and got back to our base. Oh yeah, we went to this camp, and we thought we were going to have Christmas back here in France. Warm water, and beds, and we had in the bed for months. And uh, so we, they, they gave some of the people passes to go to uh, Paris. And, uh, but they uh, didn't have so many percentage. And then we got orders to battle our balls. We got to go the next morning. So they had them peace in Paris, picking them all up, everyone up, and tell them what the, the uniforms are. So they had to come back to camp right away. And uh, then we went up at 7.30 in the morning. We packed all night. We just got out of the camp with a camper to combat, so we didn't, we didn't even get our, our guns fixed up and cleaned up and, and resupplied with everything. So we took off in trucks, grain trucks, they had the grain trucks, they put a little straw on the bottom. Ours had the, the camels over the top, too, in the, the, on the back, but some of them were just wide open on top. And the whole division, 12,000 of us, we went in a convoy 7.30 in the morning till 4.30 the next morning up to Bastogne. We didn't even know where that was. And uh, so we got there and the Germans were, they had shot, I don't know, thousands of rounds and they were still pushing towards Bastogne. They said, hold it down at all costs. So we got, got into town and went through the town and, and got out there with our guns and got them all in position. And uh, we, our forward service our, we had gone at the head, and uh, they directed the fire you know, from the front lines. So we're back about half a mile. And uh, so you know, they, they were all there, and the Germans started coming. And so we opened up on them. They didn't expect us there. And uh, so we had all kinds of ammunition, and everything just loaded. And so we stopped them. And, uh, it was in about 4.30 in the morning. So they, uh, it, it, was, it just started in the morning, and it got colder than heck, and they, they uh, were brought down. So they found out that they could go around the town. The ground had frozen enough with the tanks. They could, they could go around the town and didn't have to come through. But uh, they figured they'd go shoot through the town and it'd be to save a lot of time. That was their plan, but we were there and stopped them. And it's a good thing the ground froze because we did would have wiped us out of the head of two, three armies there. I don't know how many they had there. And, uh, but then he left us there and they just left, surfed around us. We had to pull our lines back and close in. And, uh, and then it was snowing and hot and cloudy and we couldn't get in the Air Force fighter planes or anything to help us out or our resupply us. And the 23rd, they, uh, they cleared up. And then the whole Air Force came out, fighter planes, and we had all kinds of, and our, our radios were out, so they, they dropped in two jumpers with new radios and told them what like, they needed, they needed everything. So, uh, you know, they brought supplies in the next day, I don't know, maybe it was that same day, and uh, they, they dropped, we had smoke shells, they designated the drop zone, so they would drop in the wrong place, and so they dropped them in there. And they had to push them on the plane, some two guys there, and they're pushing the chutes out. And uh, then they open up and land. And as soon as the, the planes all threw the chutes out, they, uh, they the, all our troops ran out to get the chutes. And then they opened up the whole circle with all their ADs and shot in our drop zone. And they killed a whole bunch of our guys that were out there in the, in the drop zone. 
not knowing that they were going to do that, but we should have figured it out. But uh, and then we we uh, we there's no place to go but stay there. We just changed uh, positions one time, and uh, Novell was we had that was the town we had, and uh, boy, I go why with this Novell. We had some tank companies that were there that, from the other armies and uh, tank destroyers, and you got the bazookas. And, but uh, so they, they, uh, we had this town, and it was a little bit low, and they had the big hill behind us, so they they could see a lot of things. They were, we were having a hell of a time holding it. So they finally said, uh, we're going to leave that town go, uh, General McAuliffe. And uh, he said that we had too many troops in our tanks and stuff, so we let the town go and pulled out and went to Foy and uh, protecting that town. And But the, the Germans, they pulled in that Nobel town and they killed every soul in the town, every person, civilian, and uh, just wiped the whole town out. And they were mean. And so, but uh, we kept on shooting up, up there because they were there. But, uh, we had Foy too. It was, it was, it was took part. We were in the middle, and Foy was here, and Dumbell was up here. But uh, anyhow, we, that was near the end of the war too. That we uh, we were losing too many troops in, in our uh, our tanks and destroyers. What did they drop on Christmas Day? Twenty third, they dropped some. The twenty fourth, they dropped some uh, supplies. A whole bunch of supplies. They got three of our planes, and they landed in our drop zone. And one was coming right for us. And so we said, get, get in your holes. And, and so we all jumped in the holes, and it, it should have come right over the top of my hole. It, it was, the terrain was still slanting. They left their wheels up. So they, and, and they had the, the plane was smooth underneath, and it was snow, and they, they just landed. And, but when they landed, I was stuck in my hole, and somebody said to us off on the side, it hit the ground and bounced up and down, and then there was a little steering wheel they got in the plane. Both pilots hit that, and their whole face was bloody. They were they were knocked out, and uh, so when it hit, it was coming right directly for me. It would hit in this turn like this here, and then it was a little hill, a valley here, and it turned all the way around and went back the same direction it was coming down this little valley. Both wings are dragging the motors, and. Uh, so we ran down because it was gasoline, 200 gallons each wing, and uh, we got down there and uh, pulled up the two guys in the back, or three, I forget, but it, it pushed the chutes out. They didn't get the chutes out yet because it was just coming into the drop zone. And uh, we grabbed the two pilots, unbuckled them, and, and uh, dragged them out of the plane. We thought it was going to catch fire, but it didn't. And so then our, our officer for the, the trucks and the jeeps, not trucks, but jeeps, he found a, had a hose there, gasoline, for her, and he stifled out gasoline. And so we, we got, each got a, we found some cans or jars, I forget what it was. So we got to fill them up too, and then we could take our helmet and put the snow in it, melt the turbo water. And uh, then the, uh, we left the plane, it's was just sitting there, and then we took off some blankets and some stuff that we, we could use, flashlights. And, and uh, so anyhow, they, there was three of them that landed up, uh, and that one was right close by us, but... What about the smoke that came in? Oh, Christmas Day, here comes the second drop, and they push the chutes out, just out the, the, the door there, and here comes a little small chute, a drag chute, one of those white ones, and it had a little, it had fruitcake on the bottom. That's all. It was Christmas Day. And so we got the, the one of the guys grabbed the shoot and the cake, and so we cut the cake up, and, and I hated true cake. But boy, it was good because we were out of food. So we cut the cake up and, and all had a piece, and uh, there was uh, oh, about 15 of us there. And, uh, but, and then he got the shoot, and there was some, there was some more shoots too that were scattered all over the drop zone there. But they, uh, the, the, the two other planes, they, they landed too, and, and they, they, they didn't crash, they just slid on the snow. And uh, then we was there until, oh, that was the 25th, and uh, 
our, our uh, one of our officers uh, caused or give IOU to the farm for two cows, and he cut them up and made stew out of it. And uh, a bunch of a big bushels of potatoes we got from some of the other farms in my use. And uh, so we had Christmas Day, we had stew for dinner. And uh, right by our, uh, the barn, by, that, by our guns there, so they would go 20, 30 uh, people could go up at a time because in case the shells come in there. So we all took turns. Uh, Ray and Helen, great presentation. We're really glad that you came here. It looks like they're anxious to pick this place up. Let's give, give them a big hand. The last mission, uh, when they said when they hit their tide out, we had to clean that out. We got down there, and there wasn't a German around, so we went in. And I got I got it open to the lid, and we go down the basement, and there was some handy on both sides, a room on each side, and another flight. I went down three flights. <coughs> I got this linen, yeah, German linen. <coughs> and uh, there was one of them wanted whiskey. They got a case of whiskey. They went up took it in the truck. And I was there, but uh, this was in. Uh, uh, Oliver, one of our officers says, we want to go hotel for 300 men. We took all the people off. And so the first time we ever got you know, in a hotel, and uh, it was in Austria. And then on the way up there, there was a prison camp, and we ran across, and had all these uh, civilians in there, and the Jewish people, and they were the veterans or soldiers. But, uh, they, uh, we, we took them all to the hospital, and, and uh, and uh, kicked out the uh, German prisoners over there. They don't want to stink or something. He told me to get out. He said, You're going to get out. He took a pistol off. He said, I'm going to get out. He said, Yeah, I'm going to go. And then two days, later, two days later, they drew my name for R&R, &R, 30 days after the United States. So I got the home home back two days after the war. Okay. Thank you.